Geico presents Our Town, Season 2. A 30-minute podcast produced by Best Bark Communications, a small but fierce client-centered marketing company powered by decades of experience and well-established business networks. Geico, 15 minutes can save you 15% or more on car insurance. Now, here's your host, Andy Ockershausen. This is Our Town. This is Andy Ockershausen and our guest today, unlike most of, of our town has been, are natives, but he's not a native. He's a relative newcomer, but he's not really a newcomer. He's been around. He started out on WMA here in our town and, and with a local broadcast, and now he's being heard all over America. He's on Westwood One. He's a regular on Fox News. But he's not a baby when it comes to Washington politics or holding his own in a room full of liberals. <laughs> he's had a lot of experience growing up in a media family in Chicago. A family of Democrats, so I hear. His mother and grandfather were on radio and television, and his stepfather's still in the news business. He spent 20 years at CNN, and they've been preparing him for his daily talk show, and the most popular radio show, probably on WML Radio, is the Chris Plant Show, and welcome to you, Chris Plant. Well, thanks. Thanks for thanks for having me. Oh. Our town. Yes. You're a big part of our town. Now, you have, let's say, you copped it our town, because there are not many people do what you do on radio. Yeah. Well, I never wanted to be part of this town, you know. But here I am anyway. <laughs> but I got stuck here somehow. Well, you wanted to go back to Chicago where your family was so prominent, correct? Well, uh, I mean, we we, uh, we moved around a lot, truthfully. I mean, I spent most of my years, my formative years, I'm still in my formative years, in Chicago growing up, uh, Glenview and Winnetka on the North Shore of uh, wow. Chicago. The Gold yeah. Coast. Yeah, well, the Winnetka part, certainly, anyway. Yeah, it's, <laughs> uh, it's very nice. And... Uh, uh, you know, I've been here for the majority of my life now, though. I mean, I, I fled Chicago when I was 18 years old and went to Santa Barbara, where the sun shines and a whole lot of other things you are You went better. to school in Santa Barbara? I, I went to school for a very long time. I never finished, but I went to school for a very long <laughs> UC, time. UC, of course. I picked, Well, I went to Santa Barbara City College uh, oh, okay. forever, and then I started at UC Santa Barbara. And I was busy, and I was married, and I had a job, and I lost interest, and I figured I already knew it all, so they didn't have much to teach me. So I, I, I moved on from there. That's when I went into the news business. But high school, you went to Chicago, and then you I moved did. west? I did. Yeah, Nutria West High School. Uh, and well, Wasn't uh, Jack Benny from Winnetka, Illinois? Did not hear that name. Oh, no, there are a lot of people from Winnetka, Illinois. Donald Rumsfeld. It's I a tell famous you know, name. The Nutria uh, school system, uh, you know, uh, uh, Charlton Heston and Ann Margaret and, and Rumsfeld. Northwestern. And, and all kinds of people. My mother went to college at Northwestern. Uh, one of my younger brothers went to college at Northwestern. Well, your mother was in the broadcast business when you were growing up, when you were in school? Well, my mother, uh, my mother's father, Pat Barnes, uh, who was not a liberal, he was a good conservative, <laughs> but I didn't realize that. I didn't learn that until I started doing the radio show here at WMAL. But uh, my uh, my grandfather, my mother's father, was in the radio business from the time that he came home from World War One. He fought in the army in World War One in France. And and uh, when he came home, he got into the radio business. And and when my mother was seven years old, she was already doing radio shows in New York, uh, national broadcasts. Um, uh, I have a recording of one of them from Christmas Day, 1937, from the New Amsterdam Theater wow, in New York, deal. New York, with my grandfather playing two roles at sort of a dramatic radio stage play sort of thing. And my and my mother uh, playing the the daughter of the Irish fugitive. And the police were on the hunt for the fugitive, and I have, and I do have a recording. It was drama. I, oh, it was, it was yeah, radio it was, drama. was great because that's what you could imagine what it was about. It was it really was theater of the mind before television and right. uh, and uh, movies were silent and and you know uh, well 1937 they had sound by then, but my grandfather certainly was doing radio before movie had sound movies had sound and. Uh, uh, and yeah, and my mother was doing. And then she worked in the radio business growing up. She worked in the television business when I was uh, a child. A uh, long and tortured story. But my uh, my mother married uh, Jules Orteg, uh, had four sons. I was the fourth. And my father died when I was five months old. So my mother was a thirty year old oh, widow you with, father, with four boys. That's that's correct. And uh, we all moved to where her parents were. In Milwaukee, Wisconsin, my grandfather, Pat Barnes, was kind of his retirement job at WISN there. And he was, uh, I guess, the general manager or the public affairs manager at WISN. And my mother got a show at the uh, at the station. It was uh, in the early 1960s, one of these shows where her set was a kitchen. 
right? And uh, and she sat there in an Roll. apron with a cup of coffee with the CBS eye on it and had guests and and talked about uh, right. household things because that well, was she the was era. prominent then. Was that show in Milwaukee or in Chicago? That was in Milwaukee. Well, then when the family didn't they work in radio in Chicago also or during the. Uh, Oh, Chicago they did. had so many great programs that we listened to in the East. Oh, you bet. Yeah, my uh, my grandfather uh, was on WGN in Chicago. He was on a, a variety of stations in New York. And I guess it was all New York and Chicago, a lot of national broadcasts. He was the voice of the Dempsey-Tunney fight out, wow. of, uh, out of Soldier Field in Chicago, the national uh, broadcast of that. So he did a lot of different 100, things. 100,000 people within the stadium. In the, just in the stadium, yeah. yeah. It was, and it was the national broadcast. It was, the, he was the voice of the national broadcast. And uh, so he had... A, a great career in radio and and later in television and my mother uh, from the time she was a small child until until long after after she had children uh, she still uh, kept one foot in in television throughout my childhood my teen years and, and Is your mother so. still alive no no she, she paid, yeah she, she could don't. not appreciate you now because she's not here to know how prominent you've become I and I'm sure I, she be very proud of you I'm but. I'm really uh, sad actually that she didn't get to see my going into radio her father's business and oh my and, god and yeah. I really enjoy radio you know I worked for CNN for 17 years and uh, and I had a great time and and I did good solid work but the the business was going south uh, CNN was going south I had to things change yeah jump oh, off of that train before it went off the cliff and and uh, <laughs> then I then I found myself in uh, in radio and I, I've been having a riot I just have a great time uh, well, doing radio I recall Chicago radio listening to stations and I couldn't believe what I'm hearing the the uh, the prices of hogs and the prices of wheat <laughs> they were they were broadcasting that live to yeah. Everybody in the Midwest would listen to WGN or yeah, WLS. Right? Yeah, pork bellies. Well, hey, it's the Midwest. That's, Absolutely. Uh, you know, this, and, and, and right, I'm not talking and, about a long time ago. I'm talking about in the 50s. I listened to Chicago radio. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. Well, the commodities exchange is there, and, and it's where all the, the hogs Absolutely. and the corn World. come from, uh, generally speaking. We copied the helicopter reports out of the WGN did it with a policeman flying, and we did it at WML. Upset the market, went crazy about one policeman flying in a helicopter was our traffic report. Yeah. We copied WGN. That ain't no bad place to copy. Did you have a helicopter, or did you just sit here and like slap your chest and go, No, no, we uh, had a helicopter. <laughs> Today over 270, we've got a backup near the... That's did what you, WWDC that copied us. Because uh, you could copy did, it without uh, a helicopter. So uh, many great things came out of Chicago. And not not least of which is Chris Plant. But in all these years of um, your work with CNN, you have covered the Pentagon. I did not know that. I thought that it was new to you. But you were a Pentagon correspondent for the network? I was, yeah. Um, a well, stand-up where you give the reports? I, I did every day. only at the end. Uh, my last year or so with the Iraq invasion in 2003. I, uh, again, I spent 17 years there, all of it in uh, based in the Washington Bureau. Is that uh, North Capitol Street? Is that where they were? They, uh, they're they off of North Capitol. Now we're at 111 Mass, at 3rd and Mass uh, when I started there. And then right. they, they moved over to 821st Street Northeast, right. uh, just behind Union Station. Uh, so it was always basically down on Capitol Hill. And I was a general assignment utility guy. I started as a researcher. I became an, uh, became an assignment editor, a field producer, then what? a beat producer assigned to the Pentagon. And I, uh, I spent 10 years about assigned to the Pentagon. My office was actually in the Pentagon and covered the, uh, with Jamie McIntyre, who was the on-air guy. I was the producer, but I was breaking all the news, you know. Right. Just kidding. <laughs> Jamie and I were a great team, and we worked together, and we were very successful there. But, my, you know, our office was in the Pentagon for 10 years. I didn't report to the Bureau in the morning. I always went to the Pentagon. We covered the military and the uh, intelligence did you, and you traveled a lot for the for the network. Yeah, yeah, I traveled uh, a good deal. Uh, I spent a few months in Saudi Arabia in 1990 after uh, the great Saddam Hussein invaded the 19th province of Kuwait, and <laughs> I was the director of the network pool operation in Dharan, which was where the the whole network operation was right. was based. And then uh, and then when I was assigned to the Pentagon, and I tra did some other travel, political and disasters and plane crashes and things like that. But but most of the good travel came with the Pentagon. And when you say good travel, they never send you to Paris, you know, they send you to Tuzla in Bosnia, you, know, you, you go to Hanoi, and, and, and you, you, know, you go to Albania and places like that, Severodvinsk on the White Sea in the We're northern, the world to northern Russia. Yeah, it was, look, it was great. We got to Rome a couple of times and a, a little of this and a little of that, but a lot of travel, uh, a lot of, you know, the, the Middle East, Africa, Asia, um, uh, pretty thorough globetrotting 
thing. But what, that, that enlightened you in so many ways, obviously, to the world. And uh, you brought back that to the CNN, but you also brought it to your radio audience now, yeah. correct? You can talk on a lot of things, a lot of subjects. You've seen some of it. Yeah. Yeah, I and what's I, I, certainly I've got a good background in in, in journalism for what I do now. Right. Uh, picking apart the the abomination that is journalism so often today <laughs> is one of my great pleasures, uh, and and also I mean I, I do bring the the national security background, the intelligence, the right. military things, and and I know one of the things that was uh, was brought up was the September 11th attack. I, I was. Uh, actually, I was assigned to the Pentagon September 11th and watching the planes hit the uh, the buildings in New York at home while brushing my teeth and uh, and then calling Jamie McIntyre on the phone who was driving in with his top down listening to country music on the GW Parkway. Beautiful Park day. Play. Beautiful, beautiful day. And, uh, and I told him, hey, a plane just hit one of the... Uh, towers in new york you see he said no no i'm listening to country music he said well if anything else happens let me know and i said okay and a couple of minutes later i called him back and i said well something else has happened a second <laughs> plane hit and this one was clearly an airliner and and we agreed he turned his music down and and we agreed that it was al-qaeda that it was bin laden that it was uh, a terrorist attack and that it was on we had sort of seen this coming some fashion or another for a long time and and it was on as of that moment i i hopped in my lincoln town car and raced to the pentagon and as i was pulling into the parking lot in north parking uh the plane hit the pentagon and uh and and it was kind of on the far side of the building from where i was pulling in but the explosion shook my car and the the fireball that rose out of the pentagon the, and the black black smoke. and red oh fireball God. that uh, rose up and uh, you were you were in the neighborhood that day too uh, as as i understand <laughs> i was there it. yeah and I, I made my way around i got on my cell phone you were actually, very close i was and I, I called in to the cnn bureau and uh, and i said hey there was just a massive explosion at the pentagon a uh, huge fireball uh, and I couldn't say that I saw the airplane because I hadn't seen the airplane, but I had a pretty good idea what it was and uh, started making my way around the building, was nearly shot to death by a Pentagon police officer who had me get out and do a kabuki dance and, you know, uh, play Simon Says and things well, for a while. You look very suspicious. Well, I'm a little swarthy. And, Your Lincoln and, Town. Uh, and my Lincoln Townhouse and everything. And I had my headset on with my uh, folding Motorola phone on my uh, on my waistband, and and uh, I got out of the car, and uh, who knows? I looked like I was wired right. for something, and I get stopped at TSA all the time too. So I guess I just have that look. I need a little extra security. But I, I did get on the the phone and call into the CNN bureau. I said there was this explosion, and the supervising producer there, who I got on the phone, said, "Are you kidding me? Do you know what's happening in New York?" And I said, "Well, I I do actually know what's going on, and what I'm trying to convey to you is that it's also happening here. You see, <laughs> and he said, oh, 'Oh, okay, that's a good point.' And they put me on the air. <laughs> they put me on there by cell phone, and uh, as far as I know, and certainly on television and, and nationally, I was the first person to report that the that the Pentagon had been hit. Uh, and I made my way around to the other side and saw Donald Rumsfeld." coming out with the corner of a stretcher and and uh, the, he was trying to help was there when the wall collapsed when the side of the building collapsed so uh, yeah he was uh, yeah he's a great guy i always liked donald rumsfeld very much and they say he's another winnetka boy and a new trier boy so, yeah, yeah you mentioned we it. have that connection well the amazing thing about that plane and i happened to see that pentagon every time going i was at army navy country club the the airplane, American Airlines came right on top of it. We knew what it was. Yeah. That they had reinforced that side of the building. Thank God, it, if it had hit somewhere else, it would have been a much more of a disaster. Yeah, it could have been much worse. It had just, they were in the midst of the renovation, the 10 year, whatever it was, renovation yeah, it was, of the right. Pentagon. And that wedge had just been completed. Uh, for the most part, and the wedge next to it is where it collapsed. Uh, is that right? I didn't know. Yeah, I, I guess. I, it, what did it, it do on the inside? Did it get to the inside ring at all? Well, not. I mean, there are five rings. It made it through two and a half okay. of the. Uh, Didn't get the into rings. the middle. Not all the way into the courtyard, right. but that's a long walk. So, oh, I know. You know. <laughs> that's a lot of <laughs> that's concrete. Yeah. Well, Chris, a great story, and and uh, Chris Plant is telling us about his career at CNN, and we're going to come back after a break and talk about his career as the prominent WMAL radio voice. And this is Andy Ocker's house, and this is our town. Daddy, where do babies come from? Uh, well, uh... Honey? Mommy went to the store. Oh, well, you see, um... Well, there's a mommy and a daddy, right? Right. 
and see when they call Geico,、uh, they could save a bunch of money on car insurance. Oh, really? And that makes them happy? Yes, that makes them very happy. That's good. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we could have this talk, Sunshine. <laughs> Geico, because saving 15 percent or more on car insurance is always a great answer. You're listening to Our Town. This is Our Town, Andy Ockershausen, and I'm talking with Chris Plant, a man who needs no introduction but needs a lot of introduction. Actually, <laughs> he is part of Our Town, and、um, he for his reporting. And we were talking about the Pentagon and what happened with、uh, 9/11. He won the award, Edward R. Murrow Award, from the Radio and Television News Directors, a very prestigious award. And he won on the terrorist attacks of 9/11, and in 2015 he received the Reed Irvin Award for excellence in journalism.、Mm -hmm. Chris, one of the things about in your coverage, I wonder if it was ever、uh, followed through. How can so many people be involved in this tragic day and not one word got out that they were going to do this? There were 20 people actually involved、yeah. with airplanes. One of them got sick or something and couldn't get on board. Yeah. Did any research ever done? How can they have that thing quiet? It's amazing. Well, they、uh, they were very cautious in the way that they communicated. They operated out of、uh, very obscure locations. They they communicated by courier, uh, because <laughs> they found out thanks to American news reporting that we were listening to their satellite phone. Now, <laughs> Osama bin Laden had a satellite phone, and he used and it to it. communicate liberally. And we were tapped into it, and we were listening to you know, take it off the satellite. We were listening to all of his communications until there were a couple of reports in the United States. Uh, that exposed the fact that U.S. intelligence had the ability and was actively listening to his satellite phone. And guess what happened? They stopped using the satellite phone. So the American news media helped in terms of、uh, establishing good operational security practices for Al Qaeda on the lead up to <laughs> the attacks of September 11th. And look, it was in the pipeline. The, that attack was in the pipeline for between five and six years from. Uh, concept to execution. Yeah, because the first attack was in '93, correct? That's when well, at, the, at the World Trade Center with a truck bomb in the basement, and、right. uh, six people murdered in in that one. And that you know that plan was,、uh, and it wasn't a terrible plan. The truck bomb, you remember the the rented、oh, truck, was designed to. It was placed in a specific corner of a specific tower, and the idea was it would collapse that corner of the tower. That tower would fall over into the second tower. Killing twenty thousand to forty thousand people—that was the big idea of that truck bomb. Right, didn't work out、uh, on on that occasion. But gosh, they just keep trying, don't they? And they、uh, and by the they way, they're, they're not done. And and no, I, that's that's、yeah. exactly where we've come to now.、Yeah. And you you, if, I'm sure you know that from all your acquaintances still at the Pentagon,、mm -hmm. that everybody's on very alert. I mean, anybody with any sense in the military, you got to be on alert. Yeah, and, and I know、uh, people in the intelligence community and CIA people, and and so on. And this is all very real. It's、uh, it's very serious, and and it's proceeding on a number of different tracks. But they're playing the long game, and、uh, you can expect more of this sort of thing. And think nuclear in the long term, and look at Iran and their nuclear weapons program,、right. which is still on course. It's、uh, you know it has、they're、a still、timeline. making a bomb. Absolutely, they're they're still working toward that goal. And these are not good guys. And they call us the great Satan, and we're the head of the snake. And and they're on a mission from Allah. And、um, and things. Don't usually go well when you put those pieces together. <laughs> so, It's a problem so, to a lot of people.、Yeah. And then you got our friends in North Korea that、yeah. can't make automobiles, but they can make nuclear weapons. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah, they let the Southerners make the automobiles. You、right? bet. Well, and the Iranians are in bed with them too. You、oh, find Iranian、amazing. scientists present for the North Korean nuclear test and ballistic missile missile tests, and and、uh, you know, you, really the the pieces are all out there. You don't have to be a genius to、in、put the pieces one, together. In that one, it's really, really evident that you got a major problem because those people are committed to do it. Well, and you say, why were these twenty people and a bunch of cave dwelling troglodytes living in a in a prehistoric hell able to pull this off without our detecting it?、Uh, we know that all of the pieces. Look, we knew that there were a lot of the pieces in place back then, but. And there are long explanations associated with this. Jamie Gorelick and the and the Justice Department and the Clinton administration、oh uh, stovepiped communication between the FBI and the CIA and the rest of the intelligence community, so domestic and international intelligence couldn't share information. Now, a lot of the CIA and, and international 
collectors, intelligence collectors, had information on these individuals, but they couldn't share it with the FBI, in large part because one Jamie Gorelick, a, a woman working in the Justice Department, a key position, decided that it would be unholy. It was a separation of church and state thing, according to her, <laughs> that, that intelligence uh, CIA couldn't talk to intelligence at FBI. And that the 9-11 Commission found was one of the great right. problems that we could have uh, short-circuited the, the come plan if we were anybody. just talking to one another. Yeah. Well, Bureaucracy hope, is the one word answer. Correct. Yeah. Now, I don't think that that's going to be that way anymore. I hope they've learned and I hope and pray we do. <laughs> expect that it will continue to be that way. <laughs> it's Honestly, a, expect that it will continue. Bureaucracy. The bureaucracy is the bureaucracy. Well, you know, if you keep doing the same thing, you get the same result, correct? Well, no, nothing new about that. Yeah, but in all your your travels and all the things you've done, Chris, uh, there's anything because because I know you spoke about it compared to what you have achieved and where you stand now in your career as a communicator. This has got to be an eye opener for you. People listen to you all over the country. Yeah, they might have known you before CNN, but believe me, radio is more personal. Oh, it is, and I have three hours, and uh, you know, CNN never had a show called the Chris Plant Show that went for three hours, and, and I did. Uh, in the end, I, I never wanted to be on camera. I never wanted to, to have a microphone. I never had a desire or a lust to do. You were a producer. Um, I was producer, and I was great at breaking news, and I was a great news guy. I just didn't want to uh, be in front of the camera. Now, when the 2003 Iraq invasion invasion came along, CNN came to me and asked me if I would go on the air in front of the camera because I was plugged in. I had all the connections in the Pentagon and elsewhere. Uh, I was knowledgeable. I know one airplane from another and one ship from another. And uh, You knew it, the crews, too, did you not? Did you work with oh, the sure. CNN crew? Oh, yeah, you bet. Oh, That's yeah. important. Yeah, so uh, I was, you know, I mean, a good person to put in front of the camera. I just never liked being in front of the camera. I, and when I left CNN, and I left CNN voluntarily with a great buyout, Thank you very much. Uh, I was going to uh, do a dozen other things. I, I had actually taken a job working for a Beltway Bandit organization that was going to do information operations in Iraq. So uh, I, had, I had taken that job. Uh, I'd be working with the Special Operations Command of Tampa in Tampa at McDill Air Force Base. I'd already bought a condo in Tampa. I mean, I had taken the job and I was ready to go in. I wanted to jump in and do something for my country. And uh, friends of mine who were former Green Berets uh, were ramping up with uh, an operation with a company. I'll leave the company's name out of it. Uh, and we were going to be doing uh, I.O. information operations in Iraq and perhaps beyond. And um, there was a scandal, believe it or not. With, what? With one of the Beltway uh, Bandit companies that was, God forbid, paying people in Iraq to write positive editorials in the Baghdad newspapers about the United States military and the United States of America. <laughs> so when Congress found out about that, they had to put an end to it. So they put an end to anything positive being said about the United States or the United States military in Iraq. And in the process, they put the kibosh on the operation that, that I had uh, joined. Oh. Uh, so then I was once again without a without a job, a man without a future. Um, and I ran into Chris Berry at a party. Chris Berry was at the time the general manager of WML, but I didn't know him. I, oh, really? I, you no, I didn't time. know him. No, my best girl was talking to his best girl at a party. I was standing around with a drink in my hand, uh, looking around the I room. I thought maybe like your father, had, your stepfather had played a role in your... Oh, God, no. Getting me here? Yeah, the WML connection, but that's not true. You told us something. No, no, that's no. great. Chris no, Berry no, no. met you for the first time. Then. Yeah, and we we spoke for five minutes. I kid you not. Chris Berry and I, we had never met. We spoke for five minutes. I still didn't know what he did for a living. He said to me, tapped me on the shoulder, and he said with his index finger, poke, 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 and he said, you need to come in and do a radio show. And I said, who are you, and what are you talking <laughs> about a radio show? He said, we're going to have lunch tomorrow. I said, we're going to have lunch tomorrow, are we? Okay, we're going to have lunch tomorrow. He gave me his card. I think it's classic Washington blow off. You know, we're, we're not going to have lunch tomorrow. <laughs> In fact, he called and he said uh, the next day, he said, all right, you know, noon. Uh, he named the restaurant. I went and had lunch with him. That was uh, Thursday, I think. That Sunday, I came in and did a radio show for three hours. A call in show? Nobody told me it was a call-in show. I, I didn't. I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about call-ins. Three hours is a long time. And let me tell you something. I got a lot to say. So let me. Let me. <laughs> let me. Uh, let me tell. I, I. I honestly, I didn't know you were supposed to take calls. Uh, and 
I don't think I did take any calls on the first thing. I was I didn't come in prepared to take calls because I went home after my lunch and I said to my best girl, I said, you know that guy I met at the party the other night, uh, Chris Berry? And she said, yeah. I said, turns out he's the general manager of a radio station up the street and it's the Rush Limbaugh station and, um, and he wants me to come in and do a radio show. She said, well, are you going to do it? I, I said, well, I got nothing else to do on <laughs> Sunday, so I guess I'll go do a radio show, see what that's about. And um, and I said to her, I said, I guess I better listen to some talk radio to find out what it is they do. Right. Good idea. And as those words came out of my mouth, I said, you know what? That's exactly what I should not do. I shouldn't listen to anybody. I didn't listen to talk radio. I Truthfully, I didn't know what station Rush Limbaugh was on. And I had a job. You know, I was at work. I'm, Absolutely. I'm sitting around work throwing off. cards into a hat, you know. And uh, and I said, just as those words came out of my mouth, I said, that's exactly what I shouldn't do. Because then I will either consciously or, or unconsciously mimic someone. And I don't want to do that. I'll go in and I'll do it. And if it works, then great. And if it doesn't, then I'll go sell arms in Africa or something. You know, and, and I went in and I did the show on Sunday. And on Monday, uh, Chris Berry called, asked if I'd come into the... I'm holding my hand up like I've got a phone in my hand. Why am I doing that? It's radio. And <laughs> and I said, and, and uh, he, he said, would you come into the station, please? I said, yeah, sure. I, uh, I hung up and I, I said to my best girl, I said, um, uh, well, I guess that was the shortest radio career in history. <laughs> Three hours on radio and, and that's that. And that, and that was 11 or 12 years ago. You know, Chris discovered. So, how could he discover? He he must have known you from CNN. He's a very bright guy. Chris got around. He know. knew what was going on in town. It's like I was sitting on a stool at Schwab's or something. It's <laughs> well, an obscure reference like at this point, store. isn't it? Yeah. But how many people in the Washington area that we both know? Let's have lunch sometime, which means bullshit. Yeah, They're right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. They say that to you, but it ain't going to happen. Yeah. I, I hear that all the time, and I know when people are giving me that. Yeah. So therefore, I don't do that. I never say we're going to have lunch sometime. Yeah, neither do I. I never have lunch anyway. I've well, never had lunch. Well, you work too hard. That's it. Well, I don't, I don't have I, You're when exhausted I, at noon. When I worked at CNN, you, you know, you lived on candy bars and Cokes out of machines, or you went down to the, the, uh, the cafeteria in the Pentagon and had some <laughs> mac and cheese uh, military style. Government you know, issued. Was, yeah, there was nothing good about that. I'm just not a lunch guy, you know. Well, when you travel with your number one girl, who uh -huh. is obviously responsible for most of your success. Clearly. Uh, what are your plans? Are you traveling this year or are you going to stay close to home? Well, you know, we have a um, uh, an annual sea cruise that we go on with listeners. Oh, and, yes. Uh, you know, I'm not sure this is number nine or ten coming up uh, is that right? this year. Yeah. And uh, we've really found a way to make it You must great. have made a lot of good friends, too. But we have made a lot of good friends. We have a couple coming into town this weekend, as a matter of fact. We're going to have dinner with, with them. We're going to go to the Trump. We're going to the Trump, uh, I have... where I went last night uh, as well, just coincidentally. Fabulous place. But this year, we're doing uh, Copenhagen to Stockholm with uh, lots of great stops. Uh, last summer, we did the Galapagos Islands. Wow. We do a lot of uh, Mediterranean, um, and we've done a lot of Mediterranean cruises and, and Scandinavia. And, Nine or uh, ten of them. You've seen the world then. Yeah. Well, and, thanks to WML Radio. Well, CNN <laughs> they, they, no, they definitely, no, they just send you to hell holes. <laughs> they try not to get killed. And by the way, we don't have any body armor or <laughs> gas masks for you. We're out. But have a good time. But, but uh, your travel has been a part, part of your show because you see things and bring a, your unique perspective to your radio show, which Janice and I have to like very much. One of my problems is <laughs> listening is nine o'clock is not a good hour for me because <laughs> we have to go to, we have an office and that's where we do some work. You got a job? <laughs> I got a job. <laughs> People with jobs. Anyway, we do our back. We better take a break here, Chris, because I'm getting unwound. <laughs> Hi, this is Andy Ockershausen with Chris Plant. Are you still promising yourself or your spouse to get your will updated and a good basic estate plan in place? Are you finally ready to make sure you don't leave a mess behind for your family to clean up? Give me just two hours and I'll show you how. I'm attorney Mike Collins, host of Radio's Legally Speaking show. Come to my seminar and I'll teach you what you need to know about wills, trusts, taxes, probate, how to keep your money in your family. Register now at MikeCollins.com and I'll even waive the tuition. That's MikeCollins.com. Hi, Tony Sybil here to tell everybody about our newest restaurant over off New York Avenue. It's called Ivy City Smokehouse, 1356 Oakey Street Northeast. 
right next to the Heck Company warehouse. It is terrific, and we have the only seafood smoker in the District of Columbia. So when you go to your grocery stores or your delis, ask for Ivy City Products. 202-529-3300 or ivcitysmokehouse.com. You're listening to Our Town with Andy Ockershausen. Brought to you by Best Bark Communications. Talking with the star of WML Radio, Chris Plant. To me, you're a star, Chris. Thanks. And a thing that's fabulous to me is the reach that you have achieved in a short period of time. And, and I think 10 years is a short period to me. <laughs> for my years and what I've been through. And um, I'm so pleased with, with you and your WMAL broadcast and your listeners. That's how important you are. You're important to some people who depend on you and they listen. Yeah. Well, uh, look, uh, uh, WMAL and talk radio in general um, have very loyal listeners. We have uh, we have great listeners. We have very smart listeners. We have we have listeners that are the envy. This is I'm not just blowing smoke that are the envy of talk show hosts all over the country. We have you name a subject area, um, national defense and intelligence politics have been big things lately. But uh, talk about meteorology talk, talk about, <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, quantum mechanics. And there are people in our listening area who are experts in whatever the area is, which could be daunting. Um, if you, uh, you know, I mean, I don't find myself stepping in it because I admit what I don't know. Right. And I will And you're not challenged by it. You're not afraid you want it. You know, I'm really kind of settled. I'm, I'm not worried about I'm, my ego, believe it or not, is very much under control. And I don't feel that I need to know the answers to all the questions. Uh, and I open up the lines and, and the, you know, I never do guests. I almost never do guests. I've done the, in 10 years, so you could count the guests that I've lined up and done on one hand. All right. My guests uh, are listeners, right. are, are and, the listeners. And they'll respond to you. And we have great, smart, funny, clever, thoughtful listeners who contribute to the show uh, in ways that other hosts, I guess, rely on guests to do. And I don't think three hours is a lot of time every day. I, I, some people right. might think that's a lot of time. I well, you don't have any trouble of, filling it. I run out of time every day before I run out of stuff. Yeah. Uh, I can understand that. That's a fact. But our listeners, uh, and we have listeners from all over the world. We have. I get. I've had calls from Germany and Italy and Russia and from Brazil and China, because people listen on the internet. Uh, <laughs> Having spent some time in Washington, in or out of Washington, another, right? Right, and they're the three years in the military, or some time in government, or with a company, and WML becomes their station when they live here. And when they leave, thanks to Al Gore and his amazing internet, peace be upon him, they're <laughs> able to listen to WML from anywhere in the world. And people do. I've got great listeners in Stockholm, Sweden, that I've visited with when we. Well, I mean, we had dinner with them, and we bought champagne, and uh, <laughs> you know, they recommended the hotel, the little boutique hotel. Did there. you meet them on one of your cruises? Or we did, just... we did, yeah. <laughs> but, and we always that's spend enlightened time... you to the world too, the cruises. Well, it, yeah, they've been great, and we build in our own travel around it. If we're going to end up in Stockholm, right. we'll spend another four or five days in Stockholm because we're already there, and uh, Copenhagen and Rome and and Athens and. Um, last year, we, I mean, we also travel on our own. We went to Israel last year for a week uh, before our sea cruise set out from Athens because it's just you're in, in, in the neighborhood, right? Um, and and we. Um, but that helps you with your show to have the knowledge. And when you're talking about Cairo, you've been there, you've seen yeah. it, you know what you're talking about. Yeah, I've smelled it. It's in the news now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And yeah. you, you felt it too, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, and Jakarta and and Manila and uh, you know and and, Indonesia. And, oh my uh, god! Yeah, you know, yeah. Of, of, uh, yeah. But you're not intimidated by these bright people who call you up yeah. and disagree with you if they do right. or agree. Well, you that's can right. handle both. Correct. I don't know why anyone would disagree with me, but <laughs> but people do surprisingly enough <laughs> from time to time. And if you disagree with me and and have a cogent point to make. Michael Piercy, a producer of our humble show and, and call screener, he puts them to the front of the line. I go to the caller that Michael Piercy tells me to go to. I don't let, pick randomly you let him uh, do on that. my own. I, I've, I've. Um, well, he's got a good sense of what you are and what you're doing. He's great. He's outstanding. I mean, he really is uh, but, just great. And I he like builds the, the fact show. that you have disagreement, but also the people aren't disagreeable. Right. And now you also have praises. 
So, And the truth is, when I started in talk radio, I was probably more aggressive in the way that I approached it. And, and now, quite honestly, I, I'm, I, I'm happy to let uh, people that disagree with me uh, voice vent. Their, their concerns, vent whatever they want to do on the air. I'm, I'm, uh, that's who we are. We're talk radio. Absolutely. We are the original interactive media. We invented interactive. No question. You know, forget about the internet and this and on the. And everybody's like, oh, it's but it's interactive. We've been doing that for so long on talk radio before it was cool. Before anybody called it interactive, if uh, CNN or ABC News had uh, George Stephanopoulos took calls from viewers who said, "You're so full of it, and here's <laughs> why," they'd have a very different Sunday show, and <laughs> they sure and, would. and they'd be checked all the time now we offer ourselves up to be checked by our listeners it's a beautiful thing it great it, relationship it's so democratic people. it's 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 just I'm a glad wonderful to hear you say that because i think the ultimate ultimate democratic form of radio is by play with of audience. all media disagreements uh forget about radio of all media, all media most, you're right you know they have these chat things online on some websites and and so on but it's not like talk radio no. where you're actually you get the microphone you're in charge of the show you get to say what you want to say and i let people talk i don't some talk show hosts let somebody say a sentence or two and uh, Cut some, them off. some people assume that their listeners are stupid i assume that my listeners are smart and i assume that my listeners have something to contribute something worthwhile and you know what they pretty much always do always do, do right uh, and, and they make your show yeah, they do i i agree i mean it's uh and and also another thing on the aggressive and you know yelling at people and all that stuff i think it's more fun to have fun and I think people enjoy a show where it's you're having fun. It's called entertainment. It's called entertainment. That's right. I used to be a journalist. I know the difference. I I still oh I still use journalistic standards when it comes to news and information. I'm very strict. I'm more strict than they are at NBC. I can tell you that much. Chris, when it comes to news and and uh, we had a young man I work with at, at Comcast Sportsnet, and he said, "I'm a journalist," and I said. You're going to be out of work as a journalist. If you're an entertainer, you'll always yeah. be wanted. Yeah. But as a journalist, you're history. And I was right. He was gone. And look, my favorite thing to hear from listeners is that they laugh when they listen to the show. Sure. Uh, Have some that, fun. Because, Rush Limbaugh. He's well, fun. Uh, uh, the, you know, why do people watch Johnny Carson and Stephen Colbert and Jon Stewart? And uh, you know, why, was, why is Bob Hope a household name? Because people like funny. People right. like to laugh. And if you're talking about mayhem and twenty trillion dollar debts and and serious stuff, uh, you need to laugh. <laughs> and look, our, you know, my my parents were World War II generation people. They came out of the Depression. And that was went a big World fight. War you might know that. it was. It was pretty big. And uh, and and you look at my my favorite movies from the '30s, from the Depression, from World War II, are movies that make you laugh. And Hollywood got that in the '30s and '40s when people were suffering the most they Bunby stepped Berkeley. up to make people laugh yeah entertainment you know, uh, well Chris you are just delightful and we're so glad that you're in our town but we're double glad that you're on WML you know how much that means to Janice and I but it also means a lot to the audience let's call letters still mean something yeah and it always will. I'm so glad for you and for the city that the Redskins are going to at least have an audience now. People yeah. are going to be able to hear them. Yeah. yeah. What, a, what a wonderful thing. That's right. And there is never a game between 9 a.m. and noon. So it's that's uh, right. Know, so that's it's a real Chris Plant show. <laughs> Chris, you're wonderful. We thank you so much for being here. Chris Plant with Andy Ockertown. This has been Our Town. And be listening to WMAL 630 on your radio dial. And 105.9 FM. I beg your pardon. That's new to me. And on Al Gore's <laughs> amazing internet. Thank you, Chris You Blatt. bet. Thank you. Love it. <laughs> You've been listening to Our Town, Season 2, presented by Geico, our hometown favorite, with your host, Andy Ockershausen. New Our Town episodes are released each Tuesday and Thursday. Drop us a line with your comments or suggestions. See us on Facebook or visit our website at OurTown.com.